Hi everyone, Carl Steele here, English 4101, the first video about Ibn Tufiles. Hi, Ibn Yaksin. This work is written in the 12th century in what's now present day Spain, and it is read in subsequent centuries. It's translated into Hebrew in the later Middle Ages by a man named Moses of Narbonne. He's born in Mallorca, and also, as you can tell from the name, works in Southern France. That work is translated into Latin for the first time by an Italian humanist named Pico della Mirandola. Uh, that version, however, does not get read widely. Uh, there's one manuscript of it and it's available in the library. Uh, the University Library in Genoa doesn't seem to be available online any place. And so it's a little frustrating, uh, but it is translated into Latin again uh, in the later 17th century. And here is the book here. Um, as Philosophus Autodidactus, the self-taught philosopher. One thing I want you to notice is that this work uh, title is, of course, transliterated out of Arabic script. That is, it's put from one letter uh, alphabet system into another. And so Haib and Yaksin, as how we spell it, a live son of wake in English, is spelled in this way on this particular uh, title page, which says something about uh, the way that Arabic sounded to this particular translator. This work is very influential, the Latin version, uh, in uh, the works that maybe many of you know. Uh, Robinson Crusoe by Defoe uh, is possibly inspired by this work, and it also becomes important in Enlightenment philosophy, where they are trying to think about what it is that makes a human a human by looking at these stories of, of a person who's raised an entire um, isolation from everybody else and uses his reason to arrive at important universal truths. And so the Enlightenment philosophers found this very, very attractive. Uh, this work also has a kind of summary of the whole text right here in Latin, which I have translated as in which it is shown how human reason can ascend from contemplation of lesser things to awareness of greater things. And in this emphasis on reason, this particular title page is pointing to the way that this work has been uh, championed by many writers as uh, evidence that Islamic philosophy uh, was once fundamentally rational and therefore part of the larger enlightenment project. And that these recent works, I think, are kind of fundamentally, in some ways, Islamophobic because they assume that Islamists somehow outside the mainstream of thought, outside of history, barbaric and so forth. And that by elevating uh, these old thinkers like Ibn Tufayl that are somehow rescuing Islam for, for the present. And I, I find that project extremely dubious, first of all, politically. And secondly, um, I think it's a misreading of the work. So I can walk you through the philosophical opening of this text over the course of this very brief talk. So I'm gonna talk to you about the, the opening to this book can talk a little bit about feral children because this boy, uh, Haya Binyaksin, is arguably one of them. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about spontaneous generation. Uh, and I won't go on for too long today. So the philosophical argument is very, it's very heavy lifting, really. Uh, and it requires a lot of knowledge of Islamic philosophy, knowledge that I don't have, but I do have footnotes and I can read it a little a little bit and provide you with basically a sense of the trajectory of uh, uh, Ibn Tufal's introduction to this book. So he's talking about uh, three philosophers. The first, chiefly, uh, the first one is Ibn Vajra. Uh, and in Latin, he's, his name is Avin Pace. A lot of these Islamic philosophers, their works are translated into Latin in the Middle Ages. And many of them, we know their names uh, through the Latin better than we do through Arabic, uh, because many people in the West know Latin more likely than they know Arabic. Uh, it also shows you that these philosophers are read pretty widely in medieval Europe. So in Ibn Tufayl presents Ibn Bajra as, uh, as interested in this kind of uh, connection with God that this book is about, but doing it through pure reason. And he thinks that reason can get you only so far. It's not gonna get you all the way. And then he contrasts Ibn Bajra with uh, Ibn Sina or Latin Avincenna, uh, and says that Avincenna does better, but it's still like the thinking of a blind man that can really get you only so far. It still can't get you all the way. A blind man may be able to recognize things through touch and have an understanding of what color is, but still doesn't really know 
what color is. They don't have that full light of the mystical experience. And for someone like that, you need uh, the Sufi philosopher Ghazali, uh, who dies in the year 1111. And in Ghazali's work, uh, the loss of self and God is the highest form of consciousness. And one thing Ibn Tufail is trying to do is to uh, sort of defend Ghazali against charges of heresy, that he says some things that are really kind of difficult to defend from a doctrinal perspective, and says maybe this has something to do with the kind of ec ec ecstatic near union that he has with God. He has, of course, become God, but he gets extremely close to it. And the key thing is that he transcends reason in doing that. That is, uh, a high binyaksin, this work, is going to follow a boy who, through pure reason, is able to prove certain things about the universe and even develop kind of key doctrinal points of Islam. But ultimately that reason is gonna get him only so far. And then through a kind of, he kind of invents Sufi practices and then moves even beyond that into mystical self-annihilation or near self-annihilation, which is a form of mystical practice that you can find in many, many uh, religious traditions. And one thing I also want to talk a bit about in this, this bit about uh, philosophical arguments is that opening sentence about oriental wisdom. What does that actually mean? Um, scholars have spent a lot of time arguing about what this means, and it may have something to do with the way that Ibn Tufail, who's writing again in what's now present day Spain, uh, is feels cut off from the main centers of philosophical thought in Islam, uh, which is really happening in, in a, a present, what's now present-day Iraq and Iran and, and Egypt. So he feels cut off from that. He's a very long ways away from it. He's at the other side of the Mediterranean. Um, it's also about, uh, perhaps about light. The word orient means east, literally. And he's thinking about possibly about light, the rising sun. And you see, as we, you can see in this work, as we get further into it, this image of light and illumination is extremely important to him. But he's also thinking about perhaps the way that Sufi practices, this kind of very mystical form of Islam, is something that's really very, very Eastern. And he's trying to bring it into Andalusia, what's now present day Spain, and into uh, an area that's ruled by someone who's kind of politically and philosophically reactionary. And he's trying to open that up a little bit about by bringing this kind of mystical practice into the West where he kind of feels that he's in a kind of philosophical exile. So I think that's part of what's going on here. But effectively, if you look at this introduction, understand it as following a trajectory of reason to something that's slightly above reason to something that's really almost incomprehensible because it's so far beyond a normal way of thinking. Um, that, will, that will help you understand what's, ha what's happening here because this in fact is the trajectory of the entire work of Hayab and Yaksan, except for the very, very end. And I don't wanna spoil that for you just yet. So feral children. So uh, Hayab and Yaksan, a live son of Wake, is a, a human who's baby, basically who's raised by an animal. And in that regard, he belongs to a very long tradition in storytelling. In the uh, earliest days, really up from Herodotus, a Greek historian, up through roughly the 12th century, uh, stories of children raised by animals are stories of the founders of civilizations, the founders of cities, people like Romulus and Remus, for example, are people who become great warriors or great leaders or the inventors of technologies. And from the 12th century on, stories of feral children, of children raised by animals, uh, increasingly become stories of people who are thought to be isolated in some way, to have lost something, um, that they've lost language, they've lost connection with other people, and they live a kind of miserable, pathetic life. They're stories about nobodies, effectively. And so one of the things I do in my second book is I talk about that transformation in my chapter on feral children from stories of basically what I call feral founders to feral foundlings, people who just basically come from nowhere and go to nowhere. But there's also an extremely strong interest over the centuries in the wolfish, wolfishness of so many of these feral children. There are so many stories of children that are raised by dogs or raised by wolves. Uh, from the earliest versions, Romulus and Rivas, to German stories of Wolf Dietrich, to all kinds of Irish uh, saints. And in many, many of these thinkers, especially fascist thinkers in the early 20th century, they're interested in how this kind of lupine, carnivorous, bestial, animal quality is something that says something fundamental 
about the way it what it means to be a man and they're interested especially in these kind of tribal bands of early Germanic people where they had a kind of totem animal of wolves and they say this is uh, something about what, it's, what it means to be authentically male or even authentically German and so I want to push back against that sort of story and I'm interested especially in stories of children who are taken care of by animals so Hybenjaksen of course is raised by a deer, which is a very gentle animal, and he's very, very gentle to it. When the deer goes old, grows old, uh, Hybenjaksen takes care of her, and when she dies, he does this kind of desperate surgery to try to save her life. It looks pretty bloody and terrifying, but he's really trying to find what it is that ails her and eventually realizes that her soul has left her body, and that's the point where he decides the body is no longer worth cherishing. So, this is a story that helps guide me to think about feral children in a different way, to think about them as stories about children that are taken care of. They're no longer stories about mastery and dominance and violence, but really stories about vulnerability and the fundamental dependence of what it means to be human. None of us, <coughs> none of us would be here unless someone had taken care of us. And maybe if we have that as the fundamental way we think about ourselves, not as dominant, not as powerful, but as people who need to be taken care of by others and who take care of others, that can help maybe make a better world. So that's part of what I'm doing in my own work on feral children, is I have a kind of ethical interest in these stories. But I also have to raise the question, why is there only one child? Now, it's obvious there's only one child on this island because uh, Ibn Tufail needs that to be so for the kind of argument he's making that if there's more than one, then he has a social child who's talking to other people that are developing human language. And really the kind of philosophical project of this work is to try to imagine what kind of thought can develop absent language, absent writing, absent uh, the revelation of scripture. So Ibn uh, Ibn Yaksin, through pure reason is able to arrive at the truth of Islam without ever reading a Quran, without ever reading a Bible. Uh, and he's able to achieve mystical near union with God to transcend reason really entirely on his own. And this character learns language very, very late in his life. Um, so if you notice this book is gonna be split up into seven year sections. Every seven years is a major transformation. And, and what happens with Hayab Yaksan and his development as a, as a human being and then as a religious philosopher. But why is there only one child? Given that this island is situated in India and it's through the kind of gentle application of the warm sun on it um, and that it causes a child to emerge from the mud, why isn't there more than one child? Well, philosophically, we know why, because that would ruin the book. But scientifically, there should be more than one. What do I mean? I mean that there is this belief that uh, small forms of life generate spontaneously from the mud. Um, and I'll say more about that in just a little bit, but I want to explain to you what this image is. So this is something that's called the wak wak tree or the wake wake tree. Um, it is a story or a kind of legendary thing is a tree that, whose fruit is people. So this isn't people who are hanging. This is not an execution scene. It's a scene of like an apple tree, but instead of apples, it's people. And there's some people who fell off the tree. Uh, this is from an Egyptian encyclopedia, the Book of Curiosities. But stories of this sort are uh, present in Near Eastern storytelling at least as long ago as the eighth century, because we know about this from some Chinese writers who were writing about things that people to the West of them believed. And it's written down in Arabic for the first time in the 10th century. And then it shows up in Arabic wonder encyclopedias from the 12th century on, which is the period in uh, medieval writing when wonder uh, encyclopedias are being produced by the dozens. There's many, many of them in Latin that I know that are just compendia of weird things and they're incredibly fun to read. Basically people in that era believe that the further you got from home, the weirder things got. And so it's kind of like an early form of science fiction that if you, if the further you get from home, you're going to encounter trees that bear people, trees that bear sheep. You're going to encounter uh, strange monsters. And I can show you some pictures of that maybe on, on a, in tomorrow's class. But the basic idea behind this is science uh, comes from Aristotle. And it's um, the, the science that produces Hayab and Yaksin. It's this idea that um, imperfect forms of life, things that are don't have sexual differentiation, they don't have really complicated internal organs, that things like that just emerge through putrefaction. They just 
spring into being from nothing. More advanced forms of life, they have more complicated bodies, have clear sexual differentiation. Those things reproduce uh, by sex. So human beings or chickens or what have you. Um, but things like flies or wasps or bees or eels even, it was commonly believed in the ancient world, really up through the 18th century, that these things emerged through putrefaction, that uh, maggots were, didn't hatch from eggs. They believed they just kind of emerged from rotting meat out of nowhere. And it, it really wasn't disproved until two things happened. One is that people started experimenting on meat and they just sort of take a, took a chunk of meat uh, and they put it under a jar, a transparent jar, and they just let it rot. And they found that if nothing can get in or out, uh, the piece of meat would rot, but there'd be no maggots because of course no flies could get to it to lay, lay their eggs in it. Secondly, when the microscope was invented, uh, they discovered that uh, really small forms of life actually were incredibly complicated. That uh, flies had really, really complex compound eyes, for example. I'll show you some images of that tomorrow's class from the 17th century. And that was really, really upsetting to people who believe that humans were this really, really special form of life with really complicated bodies that were uniquely complicated to discover that, that fleas and flies were really, really complicated too. And this led to all kinds of confusion uh, and people being upset uh, in the 17th and 18th century. So one of the questions behind this though, uh, in the middle ages is, well, they all believed for a fact that small forms of life would spontaneously generate, but could more advanced forms of life spontaneously generate? Um, where does a rational soul come from? Humans have this particular way of living that differentiates them from other creatures, according to most mainstream philosophy, whether it's Jewish, Christian, or Muslim. And they commonly believed, and this is also an idea that comes from Aristotle, that we have something called the rational soul. This particular soul is independent of the senses that can just think on its own without having to respond to outside stimuli. And um, most theological thinkers said, this is a soul that comes directly from God. It can't generate spontaneously because then it would be kind of a material thing. It would just belong to this world. And the characteristic of the rational soul is that it lives forever because it's independent of the body ultimately. And Ibn Tufayl doesn't seem to be troubled by any such doctrinal limitation. He imagines that a soul, a rational soul can actually happen through purely material processes. And that's a point I think where he probably got into trouble with more um, orthodox theological thinkers. So I want you to understand though, that this is not necessarily irrational or unscientific. It may be unscientific in the sense that we think of it, there's no experiment here, there's no control group, there's no attempt to repeat things. It's done on pure observation. But as you see in the way that uh, Ibn Tufayl proves that the sun is not hot, but rather it's the light of the sun that causes heat. Um, and that heat of that light all depends about on the translucency of what it is he's striking. So he manages to prove through that discussion that the sun is actually not hot, which we know is incorrect. But it's done through reason, it's done through a series of rational argumentations. And there's a similar set of rational argumentations made through uh, to prove spontaneous generation as well. That is um, through pure rational observation, you can often come to conclusions about the world that are desperately and pathetically incorrect. And so it's really too simple to simply just divide reason from unreason and say that rational things are true and then irrational things are merely emotional. There are many, many rational arguments that have been to file and other thinkers, even through to the present day, that are just simply untrue because reason in its pure form can get you only so far. So we'll talk about this in more detail tomorrow.